finish this lab out, and then we'll come back to flip flops. Now in your lab, uh, by the way, so this is required. What does it say right here? Summary on the circuits operation in space provided, provided. Uh, so this is up to you. We went through the circuits in class. So what I'm doing here on this one, uh, is that it would be real hard to see uh, it would be extremely hard to see this. So what I'm doing here is I'm hooking this up to the clock output of the trainer. And what I've got is I've got a uh, Well, right now, I got a 10 kilohertz clock. And for us to really see this, guys, what I've done is instead of using three, I'm using five. I got to have an odd number, right? So an even number doesn't invert, and an odd number does. So this will give us around 150 nanoseconds if I'm using a standard series, which will give us a pretty good pulse, obviously. <laughs> so this is a positive edge detector. A rising edge that would probably be more correct. Are we okay? This is going to disappear, by the way, guys, as soon as I hit the okay. What I need to do is bring up my clock. No, it won't let me do anything while I'm drawing. So this is a rising edge detector. And if I used a OR gauge, it would be a negative edge detector, right? But we're going to see the circuit operate, and after that, we're we're going we're going to realize if I see a gate, or if I see a combinational circuit that's got that right there, what does this mean? As soon as I see the triangle, I know it's a what? It has an edge detector. My, I'm sorry guys, this guy's real slow.
to the more right. If they don't have a bubble outside the triangle, I know it is a rising edge detector, right? If I do see a bubble, that means it's a falling edge detector. So we're using 7411, which is a three input AND gate. I don't know why they did that. Uh, <clears throat> so what I have is I have uh, two of them connected together. Uh, this is one, this is two, this is 13, and this is 12. And of course power, it's a 16 pin dip, so uh, I'm sorry, it's a 14 pin dip. So 14 is VCC, and then uh, 7 is common. I oh, got it. So as soon as I hit escape, it's going to erase everything. I thought I'd already brought my camera up, guys, but undoubtedly it didn't come up when I thought it did. We looked at the circuit the uh, the other day, so this is the circuit we have in our lab right here. And of course, I'm I'm using a clock input, right? And this is the one I just drew on my PowerPoint. Uh, here they're using the inverters on the top. It's got to be an odd number, right? To understand. So when this right here is a zero, the output is going to go to a zero, period. But what happens is this zero right here has a delay between when this one responds and that one responds. And what we were using is we were using, what, 10 nanoseconds. So that means if I add all these three together, I get at least, I get about a 30 nanosecond uh, delay between when my other input responds instantly. This guy has that delay. So this will go to a what? A one. This will go to a what? Zero. And this right here will go to a one. Okay. So what happens when this goes to a one? Well, that puts a one right here. And there's now all of a sudden I have two ones. That other one is not going to change for what? 30 nanoseconds. So it means what happens is I got all highs for an instant, I get a little pulse. Then this goes through, right? This will go to a zero, this will go to a one, this goes to a zero, and my output will go back to a zero. So what happens, I get a little pulse only on the rising edge. So it means if I was to come over here and put a clock like this on the input, if I can get this thing to draw correctly, then on every one of these, I'd get a little what? Pulse. But only on the rising edge. If I change this over to OR gate, I would get a pulse on the what? On the low end gate. So these are edge detectors. So that's what I'm getting out of this thing. When I come over here and look at this, i got to take off the ball. Now I'm not using three, I'm using five. You gotta have an odd number because it's gotta be inverted, right? The trouble is if I turn it down so you can see it, uh, let's slow the thing down. I don't know if you can still see a pulse on the next drive edge because it disappeared once I slow my scope. 
yeah. So we can't see, if I get too slow, you can't see. Oops, sorry. So there's the little pulse right there, right? I have it on uh, 100 nanoseconds per division. So what is it, about 50 nanosecond pulse we're getting out of the thing? But only on what edge? Rising there. And this is what we call rise time, guys, because it's impossible for a digital circuit to go from a from a low to a high with no time, right? So every clock is going to have what we call a rise time and fall. And we measure that between 90, uh, on this side, we measure that between 10 and 90 percent in case we have any overshoot. So rise time is measured between 10 and 90 percent of full, uh, full amplitude. And fall time is measured between 90 and 10. This scope doesn't have it, but uh, I can show y'all one of our older scopes and it's, it's actually got 90 Ten percent on the on the face. You said rise time between ten percent and nine, because what happens is sometimes we have what we call undershoot. Uh, a lot of times, what we'll see, and you can see it a little bit right here. See, look, see where it overshoots just a hair and comes back down. Well, what we do is we we look over here and we say, okay, we're going to do this rise time between nine. So if I was going to do this rise time, of course, I'm going to spread it out. Let me turn off the channel for <laughs> and Then what I would like to do is I would like to get these guys on even, even terms. I would like to have it there and there, right? You understand? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, this guy here. And I'm going to put it on fine. And you notice what I can do now is I can just raise it just a little bit at a time. Okay, so now we got six divisions. So what's 10% of six, six divisions? 0.6 which would be three of these little guys down here. And then I can come up now, and I can spread it out. Now I can measure the rise time. Three, four, six. So what would I do is I would move that right there. And then I would go from my, I would go what? That's a little overshoot right there. Three, four, six. It could be right there. So we're going from here to there, right? So what with 10 nanoseconds, so the uh, 10, 20, 30, about 40 nanoseconds rise time. Okay. And then I could I could measure the fall time the same way. So that's why we have the fine adjust on the scope. So you've got to be real close to that. If you notice my voltage is only moving in 10, 10 millivolts. So if you come over here and you're turning the knob and it's just fair to move, then odds are it means somebody took it off course and it was fine. And then of course it moves in twos, uh, five, twos, fives, and tens, right? So that's rise time. And what you can actually see is you, if I turn it right here, it looks like it's what? It looks like it's vertical, right? You understand, but it's impossible for this thing to go from a zero to a one in no time. Impossible. So we call this over here the what? Rise time. Can you can, you can really see the overshoot right there? So what we wouldn't do is we wouldn't use that overshoot. We would come over here when it finally levels out. And then we would do the measure between what? 10 and 90 percent of the full amplitude, right? And of course, the fall time. <laughs> my scope. So notice this is what we call an undershoot. 
because it's going 90 to nothing, and it's almost impossible for that thing to stop and just go straight on, right? So it overshoots and comes back. So uh, this would be called overshoot. This would be called undershoot. The other one's called overshoot, right? And here we would measure between what? 90 and 10. So when they show you all that data sheet, so. Okay, guys, that's all we're going to do, I think, in that lab. We're not going to hook up. We've got another flip flop that we're fixing to talk about. Now we've got this circuit right here. Are we supposed to construct this circuit right here? No, we're not going to answer all the questions. I'm fixing the day which one. Now, everybody okay on what's going on here? So what I have is I have this hooked up to one of our training switches, one of our trainer switches. And then, of course, what I'm doing, uh, I've got my scope on store and I've got it on single phrase. And I've got it set to trigger on the rising edge. So what do we call this? What do we call this? This is, I just got this hooked up to one of the trainer switches. That's all I have. I have this hooked up to switch number four. And right now I've got my scope set up to store. So I've got, I've got my scope on stop and then I'm going to hit single. I've got it on normal trigger, which means it's not going to do anything until it sees a trigger, right? So now the, Trace look now the display looks blank. That's a, this is just a regular switch. It's bouncing right. So this is contact bounce, right? Y'all understand that? Now on your circuits, it means nothing, right? You understand? Because this guy's only bouncing for about 200 microseconds, and the LED might go off and go on, but to you it stays on all the time, right? You understand? So the circuits that we have so far. Contact bounce doesn't mean nothing because they're very slow moving circuits and we're doing it. The more and more we move into high circuits, higher speed circuits, we're going to have to get rid, especially counters. So, uh, counters. So what would a counter count this is? It would count that as two when I only did one. One. I, that's what I meant. I need to bring my mouse in. My, my mouse uh, got out of the limits of the debounce circuit built into the, into the software. And every time I would click my left mouse button, I would get, I was trying to use my calculator and I'd hit a nine and it would put four of them because of why. Kevin, wake up, buddy. So, what we do, one of the, one of the best debound circuits. Now computers, computers do it by software. And the problem with software is eventually that it's going to get out of the limits of the software. Right? Does that make sense? Hardware, if we debounce this with hardware, then it's going to work forever. And one advantage of hardware over software is hardware will use, always be faster.
So if we look at how, so we got two switches over here. That are blue. I lost my camera guys. I unplugged it. I got so many cables up here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my scope. So I was hooked up, I was hooked up to I was hooked up to here. Okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it over to this guy. Huh? Over to these blue ones. And I'm going to set my scope up again, and I'm going to put these things. So there's something here that debounces that switch, right? And I could pop this thing as hard as, you, as hard as I want to. So I snapped it. Y'all hear me say so it's snap. So those contacts are what? Are bouncing. So once we set a latch, an SR latch, if you keep setting it, what's it going to do? It's going to stay set, right? You understand that? So here's the debounce circuit for the trainer right here. So they're using single pole double throw switches over here. Over here they're using single pole double throw. If I flip the switch on this side, it connects it up to a pull-up resistor, which is connected to VCC or plus 5 volts. If I switch the switch on this side, it connects it down this line right here, uh, which takes us back to circuit common, right? You see that? Now, on this one right here, this feeds the tieback NAND, which sets and clears on what? Tieback Norris sets and clears on highs, so tieback NAND set and clear on what? Lows. But I come over and flip it to this position right here and the switch bounces. So as soon as it touches that first time, it's going to set this guy right here, right? And it keeps bouncing. Well, it don't make any difference if it bounces, right? You understand that? So here's the debounce circuit right there. And then this is where you're connecting. We have a, we have a, a one, they call it a one and a zero, but it's just opposite of each other. So one of them will give you high when the switch is up, the other one will give you a low. This is a moment contact, this is a moment, a momentary contact switch, which means when you let it go, it's going to return back to the other side. So there's a debounce circuit inside the trainer. Uh, here's the LEDs right here. So when you connect to the LEDs, you can come in, uh, right here so you come in this is your plug you come over and you go to a voltage divider which is trying to show you this voltage divider is trying to see a legal high what it is so uh, you're not putting the full voltage on there uh, these are gates that are unused
Now this is the function generator right here. So this is an integrated circuit. We'd have to look it up. This guy's actually generating all your clocks. And then I come over here. Uh, we'd have to look this up. I can't see the number. They've got the output of all these inverters. They got the inputs connected together and all the outputs connected together. What in the world is going on there? This guy's so slow, guys. So I got three of them. They act like inverters, right? I need to be doing this on PowerPoint. Oops, I don't have it like that. So what in the world is this circuit doing? While I have this, what do you think? They've got them connected in parallel. Why do you think they're doing Still an inverter. They still work as an inverter. So why are they doing that? And not just doing this. Huh? No, no. So let's say this guy right here can sink 16 milliamps. This guy can sink 16 milliamps. This guy can sink 16 milliamps. It means now we can sync what? They're hooked in parallel. Huh? It means I can sync 48 milliamps right there. So whatever they're doing here, they need a lot of current compared. Right? Uh, this guy right here, if it's a standard TTL, it can source 400 microamps. This guy can source 400 microamps. This guy can source 400 microamps. So that gives me 1,200 microamps or 1 1.2 milliamps that this guy can source. Either they need more current to drive something with a high or they need more current to drive something at the low. And they decided to do it this way instead of adding a transistor. Now we could do it. We could do it like this, but the problem is that this right here works as an inverter too. So we could use a transistor to get a lot of current drive out of that, but undoubtedly they didn't want to add, add a transistor because they had to use the inverter somewhere else. So yeah, these works as inverters. We have to go back and see what this thing is actually driving. So here's our final output right here, and this is going out to a buffer clock. So this is actually driving this guy, this little, this red guy right here that we're using. So what it does, it gives more drive to this output right here, right? Does that make sense? Now this one, they're using this inverter, and then they're using it to feed these other two guys right here. So this is, this is going over 
Oh no, guys, this is coming over. Oh, the input is fed by this guy. So actually, actually we're doing this. I didn't see that. So they got one guy right here, and then they got this. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. So that's the circle they have with them. And these are all connected together. So what kind of drive would that give us? If this is standard TTL, we, we assume around 16 milliamps. So what could this guy here drive? That's prime 5, right? Understand. So that'd be what, 80 milliamps? It could, it could sink. And then, uh, um, 2 milliamps it could source. So that's exactly what they have that use. Next guy we're going to look at, now this guy is the basis for all counters, guys. So these are counters, is JK flip-flops. Now how they got the name JK, it's the name of the two pins and who came up there. So what we're going to have on these guys is we're going to have one bit put called J, we're going to have one input called K, we're going to have one input that's going to be a clock. And over here, we're going to have a Q. We're going to have a not Q. And odds are these guys are going to have a preset. And they're going to have a clear. At least a clear. Master Slave, what this guy does is... So if we put a zero, now this is on the this is on the clock, so they're not showing the clock right here. If we come over here and we put a zero on the J and a zero on the K, this guy's gonna do what? Latch. If I put a one on the set, which is the J. If I put a 1 on the J and a 0 on the K, then Q is going to go to a what? 1. If I put a 0 on the J and a 1 on the K, then this will go to 0. If I put a 1 on the J and a 1 on the K, it says it's going to do what? Top. What do you think that means? Huh? When we're talking about what it, we're talking about Q and not Q, right? You understand. So a one on a one on the J and a zero on the K would set it. A zero on the J and a one on the K would when we say set, we mean Q goes to one. Right? When we say reset, it means Q goes to zero. When we say toggle, what does it mean? It's going on with Q. Huh? That's exactly right. So whatever state it was in, it would go to the opposite. So we said and clear it with 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 our with our synchronous inputs these are going to be synchronous inputs right so let's see if we can look this up so master slave jk flip flop uh, we're going to look at a 74 76 and it's not necessary even to know this guys uh, this is going to be i think let's look at the 74 76 
I can't remember which edge it triggers on. I think it triggers on every night. So here's a symbol. Okay, so it's got a clear and it's got a preset. There's two of them in there. Here's the clock input. It's got the what? The triangle. And then it's got the bubble. So what does that mean? It says true on the fallen edge. Okay. So my J input for latch for flip flop number one is is pin four. My K for is sixteen. So here's another one that does not use the most the the, the uh, top pin on the right and the bottom pin on the left. So here pin five is what BCC and here ground or common is pin what thirteen. We have two JK flip flops in there. And these are called flip flops. The 74, the 7475 was called a bi-stable latch. Bi-stable means it's stable in one state. If you it'll stay stable in one state, you can switch it into another. So it's called a latch. This guy here is called a flip flop. Now why is it called a flip flop? Because of that toggle condition, right? The dang thing does what? It, Flip flops. So here's the here's the true table. It says that preset is a low and clear is a high. The clock input is what? Don't care. J input is what? Don't care. K is what? Don't care. Q would go what? High and not Q would go low. Here says that preset is a high and clear is a low. Clock don't care, J don't care, K don't care, Q output goes low and not Q goes high. Because we just told it to clear it, right? You understand that? If my clock inputs are both low, right? Don't care, don't care, I, I have two highs and then I got this note down here that says it's not stable. So we want to avoid making your clear and your not and your clear and your uh, preset low at the same time. So that means when you try to bring it out of it, it's no telling if it's going to come up to be set or clear. If your preset is high and your clear is high, you you have a clock pulse, then and J is high and K is low, then Q does what? Q stays Q output. Q stays, not Q stays the output. So it's going to be what? It's going to be latched, right? You understand that? Yes or no? If clock is a high and preset is a high and we have a clock pulse, then if H is a high and K is a low, then Q goes high. And not Q does what? Goes low. If preset is a high and clear is a high and we have a clock pulse, and J is high and K, I'm sorry, J is low and K is high, Q goes low and not Q goes what? High. The preset is a high and clear is a high and we have a clock pulse and J and K are both high, then this sucker is going to be what? Toggle. What does that mean? It means your Q is going to flip, right? And if Q flips, it means your what? Your not Q is going to flip. Right? And this state right here, guys, this makes these things act like counters. We'll look at that in a second. Uh, the device contains two independent positive uh, pulse trigger JK flip flops with complementary outputs. The J and K data is processed by the flip flop after completion of a clock pulse. While the clock is low, the slave is isolated from the master on the positive transition of the clock. 
the data of the JK inputs are transferred to the master. So what they're saying is that this guy latches the the the, the uh, it's got two it's got two D flip flops in here. And the first one and then the second one latches, which basically don't mean much to me. Okay. So this guy's gonna latch on which edge? The low going the low going edge. Uh, the clock is uh, high, the JK inputs are disabled, right? A negative transition of clock, the data from the master transfers to the slave. The logic state of the JK inputs must not be allowed to change while the clock is high. The data in the transferred, uh, so it says, while the clock is high, we don't, we, the two inputs need to be stable, right? This is the makeup of it right here. Can you imagine the circuitry right here? So we have an, an AND gate. This is where we get our clock, and that's not exactly true, guys. Uh, this would be if it's an edge trigger, but a JK flip-flop is not edge trigger. So what we would have uh, is we would have, on one of these inputs, we would have what? Uh, No, we would have this is this is negative edge trigger, right? Not, this is not gonna work. So here we go. So this is my clock, which most of your data sheets call it C L K. And what do we know about it? How do I know it's edge triggered? The triangle, right? Everybody okay? Then I got the bubble, which means it's edge triggered on the wire. Falling edge. So, uh, this is going to be neat. Notice they have both the J and K set to what? Set to what? One. So it set up the watt. So what we'll do is we'll start off the queue somewhere. In fact, we start off by we start off by setting it. So this is clear. This right here is preset. The book calls them set S and R, but I've never seen that on the actual data sheet. So what would Q go to? So we're starting off by doing what? Clearing it. So Q, not Q would go what? Let me start. Q would go what? Low. Right. So here we have a positive transition of the clock, right? You understand? This is high. So we're not resetting it. And then we've got a net, we got an edge triggered, a negative edge triggered, and we got it set up to toggle, so it'll toggle right here. What would it do right there? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the negative edges of the clock. So what would what would it do right here? So what is it going to do on this rising edge? It's only triggered on the negative going edge. So it's going to do nothing. What's it going to do here? It's going to toggle here. What's it going to do right here? Toggle here. What's it going to do right here? Toggle here. Every falling edge. Only 
Yeah. Right here. Yeah. I would call that in Corona because it's something way up that's a little bit I understand. Now, once we started this going, uh, this is one cycle. Uh, this would be two cycles. This would be three cycles. Over here, I had one cycle. And then, of course, if we did it again, so over here, if I count, if I did it one more, so we're over here, I had four cycles. Here's one cycle. Here's two cycles. So for four cycles in, I got two cycles out. So what's the relationship between the Q and the and the clock? Four cycles in, two cycles out. Huh? Yeah, so the output is one half of the input. So this guy's going to divide by two. If we tie the two inputs together and bring a clock into it, it's going to divide by two. And I thought they had another one on here where they match the play. This is the same thing, guys. Oh, no, here they're taking. So let's see what these things are going to do. So here we're starting off. Here they're going to start off with doing what with it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the clock edges. And all I'm going to do is identify the low going edges. Are we okay? Just no. So we start off by doing what? No SD. This is preset. This is clear. So on this one, we're bringing the preset. So that means my output is going to go to what? Zero. Here, the D input is a zero. That's going to put a zero here and a one there, right? So what's that going to do? Ain't toggle because it's uh to, to get it to toggle both inputs have to be ones. Here are the two inputs will never be. Yeah, okay. The data line is this guy right here. Kevin says it's gonna stay low. Why is that? You're right. Because no, they, don't, they both don't have one. But if you look at our data sheets, it says uh, J and K. It says zero zero. This is going to be latched. I'm sorry, in my screen, I still ain't got this fixed. So we can latch it two ways. We can bring the clock high. So if the clock is high, it's going to latch it, right? Understand. But here we got a what? Here we got a one on the J, a zero on the J, a one on the K, and then we have this clock. So the K, the K input clears it. The J input sets it. So you're right, it's going to stay low. It's going to stay low. 
here it should go uh, uh, here it should go low and here it should go high. Now what they're doing with the circuit, I don't know. What would this guy do? So we're going to start off by setting it, right? Huh? Because we're telling it to toggle, right? Okay. So this will go zero, this will go zero, this will go zero. That's going to say latched. And then right here, it's going to do what? Say it. Can't say toggle. Toggle means the opposite of, right? You understand? Here, it's going to set it. So if it was already set, it wouldn't toggle. It would stay the same, right? And then this right here. So that's what we get out of this. So here's the here's the 7476. This is a little more. So said is low. Of course, they don't call it said in the data sheets. They call it what? Preset. They don't call it reset in the data sheets. They call it clear, right? And they don't call it CP. They call it what? Clock. And our clock, if we looked at the symbol, it's going to be like this, which means it's looking for a what? And now you're going edge. So this says if preset is a low and clear is a high, notice your asynchronous inputs have priority over the synchronous inputs. So J and K are synchronous inputs. They're timed with what? With the clock. Your preset and clears, guys, these are asynchronous, means when they occur, they, they happen instantly, right? They're not timed with anything. These guys have priority over your synchronous. Because look, if your preset is a high, what does it say about what does it say about the clock input? It don't care. What does it say about the J input? It don't care. What does it say about the K input? Don't care. So Q goes high. And not Q does what? Goes low. Right? You understand that? If said is a high and clear is a low, this guy right here don't care, don't care, don't care. Q goes to a low and not Q goes to a high because we're telling it to do what? To clear it. If this is a high and this is a high and we have a positive transition, and if J is low and a K is low, then Q stays at Q and not Q stays at not Q. The data sheet says it this way. Q out, so Q equals to Q out, and not Q equals to whatever Q out was, right? So it stays what? Last, right? If H is a, if, if we're not presetting to clear it, we have this, J is a high, K is a low, then Q goes high and not Q goes low. Here, if K is a low and J is, is K is a high, then J is a low and K is a high, then Q goes low, not Q goes high. If this is high and this is high, then Q became what, what not Q was, right? You understand? And Q goes to whatever, and not Q goes to whatever Q was. So this is going to cause it to do what? Copy.
So we can use these as frequency dividers. So if I come in with one, I will get half of the clock on the other side, right? Oops, something. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm not going to, just to keep from getting this thing messed up, I'm going to put a one on all these. What I'm gonna do, let's, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, let's start all these things off, uh, preset. I mean, I'm sorry, clear. So what what I've got is I've got one on the J all the JK. Dang it, guys. Huh? So I'm going to start off with these things cleared, okay, and what would happen on this pulse right here. So I've got one here and here, here and here. What would happen? Okay, so this guy would toggle, so this guy would go to a 1, right? That would cause this to go to a 1, but it sets trigger on the logo and edge, so nothing's going to happen here, right? Are you okay? So I come over and do again. This right here would go to a 0. That would cut this one. This right here would go to a 1. I'm sorry right here. Sorry. 
Why say Kelly? It's going to cause this guy here. It's going to cause this guy right here to toggle, right? Understand? Because these guys toggle on the low going edge of the clock, right? So I started off with what? Zero, zero, right? When I had this one, when it went like this, this one went to a one. This one didn't do anything because it's looking for a low going edge. But now I've got a one right there. I come over here and do this again. This is going to go back to a zero, which is going to toggle this one and make this one go to a one. Okay, makes sense. I come over and do the same thing. It's going to cause this to go back to a one, right? You understand? On this edge right here. Right? This gives us one one. And then I come up here and toggle it again. Then these will toggle back to zeros. Now, if I lay this out backwards, so this was, if this is the least significant digit, this is the most significant digit. We started off with zero, zero, we went like that, we went like that, we went like that, and then we rolled around with zero. What am I doing? Now this would be equal to a decimal zero, this would be equal to decimal one, that would be equal to decimal two, this would be equal to decimal three. Huh? So zero, 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 one, one, zero. So this is what the outputs went, and then it rolled around, right? You understand? So if I converted that to decimal, I'd get a zero. If I converted this to decimal, I'd get a one. If I converted this to decimal, I'd get a two. If I converted that to a decimal, I'd get three. It's what? Counting. And if I added another, if I added another one, it would do, this would have caused it to do what? If I added this guy right here, if y'all could still see it, then I would have a, this guy. So these guys can. That's what they do. So they're counting every edge, right? One, two, three. And then on the fourth one, it rolls around. because. But if I add another flip-flop, a JK flip-flop, it would count one bit more, one more bit. So these guys, when we do that one big feature of toggling is that these suckers right here will count. So all our counters are based on JK football. Every one of them. And we'll see how they can do that. Okay. Um, so what's the two types of modulation can our radio and our car pick up? Frequency dot modulation and ampl amplitude modulation. So amplitude modulation would mean if I come over here guys, I gotta run this off too, so So if I was trying to modulate this sound right here using AM, uh, then what would happen is my AM signal would come in like this, and it'd be riding on the carrier, and the carrier would be doing this. So when it was zero, of course, my, my, then it would come over here and start off, and then it would start going up, and then it would be maximum. And then it would start doing what? Dropping back down. And then it would come over here, hit zero, right? And then it would come over here and do this. So what I'm doing is this is the carrier. It's moving at a real high frequency. And what my AM, what my, what my signal is doing is changing the water. 
the amplitude. If this was frequency, though, if this was a, a, a frequency modulation, then what it would do is it would have one, uh, it would have one frequency right here, and then, and then it would stay the same amplitude. So it might be doing this, and then it would spread out like that, and then it would come up here and do that again. So frequency modulation, the amplitude of the signal we're trying to mod modulate changes the what? The frequency. And when you set up your radio, you're tuning in, the, you're tuning in the frequency of the carrier. Right? You understand? And so that a bit gives us the ability to, you know, I go up there and put my radio 93.7 megahertz. That's the frequency of the carrier that that radio station's sending out. And we can set up what we call a tuned circuit, which only lets the carrier come through and blocks everybody else. Right? You understand? So that's the beauty of modulation. Amplitude, that's what you're doing. You're letting the carrier come through. Now, the advantage of FM over AM is, is electromagnetic interference change in noise. So AM is very noisy. In fact, you pick up 60 cycle in AM all the time. So anytime you listen to a radio station, you hear that zzzz all the time because of Alabama power, right? You understand? Uh, electromagnetic interference cannot change the frequency. So that's why FM is so much cleaner. Uh, in, in digital, we don't call it, we call it amplitude shift keying, ASK, and this is called FSK. So what happens, ones and zeros would have one frequency and a zero would have another. Uh, then what we can do is we can use what we call a phase shift. So when I'm trying to send a one, what would happen is my carrier would actually come over here and do a phase shift. And then it would come up here and go up like that. And then when it does a zero, it might shift the other direction. This is called phase shift key. And this is the way we do. So this is digital right? So ASK, FSK, and PSK, these are digital. But I'm, my carrier is still AC, right? Does that make sense? And then we have what we call quadrature amplitude modulation. Quam which is a combination of ASK and PSK. And this is what we use right here. Because this, this right here, you can let like 16 bits right on one side. But this, but what we do with, with frequency modulation is we do what? We place the digital signal on a carrier. And then when we're through with it, we get rid of it, right? You understand that? So we have a modem. So the guy that gets rid of it and puts it back to multiple signals, we call that a, a demodulator. So what do you have on your cable at home? You have a modem if you've got a digital, if you're using network, if you're using the internet. What does the M do? Modulates it, puts it on an AC carrier so you can send it over the cable. It does not interfere with any of your channels because it's got its own frequency, right? You understand? So none of your channels, how many channels do you have riding on that same cable? A lot. Plus your internet, right? Well, how can they all ride on that same cable at the same time? They are modulated. They're put on an AC. They're put on a carrier at a certain frequency. So when you tune your TV to channel 13, you can look up the code, guys. It will give you the frequency of the carrier. And what it will do, it, it will let your channel 13 signal, modulated signal come through, and it blocks what? Blocks everybody else, right? Y'all understand that? And so that's what you're doing. You're setting up what we call a tuned circuit. And then one of them in your, in your, your internet is at a different frequency. But the problem is, is that you're sharing the bandwidth with all those different frequencies. Time domain multiplexing, if you're on that media, you got the entire bandwidth of the media. You know, either one of them, the more people that's on it, the slower you get. Because they can only take that bandwidth that they have and divide it between so many people, right? You understand? So when's your internet the fastest? Probably about two or three o'clock in the morning, right? Most people that play games, when do they play? They play it, yeah, online games. They play at night, right? You understand? Because they get more bandwidth. 
And why, when's the worst time to check your email? At 8 o'clock in the morning, why? Everybody's checking their email, right? And they might have 15, 15 sections, and when 15 people's got that, you still got to wait your turn. So both of them, the more people you have, the worse it is. Let me get up here and run this up. So I need to print this one off. 